Thank you. Thanks very much for that. So, uh, thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, so, as I told Skip, the last time I had uh, been here, it was a very, very rainy day when this library next door had opened. And it was rainy this morning. In fact, hail when I arrived. And I said I'd bring the sun, and I did. Uh, but it's, it's great to be here. Thank you, Skip, for, for welcoming me down into, to Fulbright country and, um, and to Little Rock. And um, I grew up on a small farm, so when I came past Heifer's International, I said, damn, that's a lot of stalls to clean. <laughs> I so, uh, since learned a lot about what they do. So, at a college faculty meeting, uh, an angel suddenly appears and tells the head of the philosophy department, I'll grant you whichever wish of three blessings you choose, wisdom, beauty, or $10 million. And the professor doesn't hesitate for a second and she chooses wisdom. There's a flash of lightning, and professors transformed. But she just sits there and looks sad and starts staring down at the table. Everybody's sitting there just as you are, and one of her colleagues finally whispers to her, you have to say something. And she whispers back, I should have taken the money. <laughs> That's obviously not what happens here at a school of public service. And I think the interesting thing for Americans is we have a lot of ambivalence about public service. People who are in it know that. And I think it gets back to the whole question of our sense of our mythology about our self-sufficiency what we think we can do for ourselves, it's kind of embarrassment if we ever need something from anybody else. And it gets into a question of the stories we tell about our country and ourselves and who other people are. And it reminds me of, as a writer, of, of one of my favorite things that was a, some credited to Mark Twain some credited to the gonzo journalist Hunter F. Thompson, some credited to two dueling Texas brothers way back in 1882, but it's that saying, never let the facts get in the way of a good story. But now it turns out that neuroscientists are saying the same thing. Because facts, as a former president not from Arkansas famously once said, are stupid things. Stories, unlike facts, are who we are. They tell us our tribes, our communities, our alliances and allegiances, and we fight like hell for those stories. There are many arguments, many debates we have in politics, religion, families, where we're actually not looking for factual answers. We're looking for missions accomplished. We win, you lose. We're in, you're out. We know who we are. So one answer we often feel in government, I would say the administration I work for, maybe progressives generally have a tendency to feel, well, maybe we should let the facts get in the way of good stories for a change, and that will fix things. If only we would just get the facts, people would figure this out, and we could just tell people the truth, and things would be solved. And often we do. There's a lot of good science that people don't argue with, some things that don't really hit buttons. But interestingly, research 
is showing us that we're all guilty of being misled by our stories. Liberals, conservatives, northerners, southerners, Americans and people from other countries, gun owners, advocates of things big and small. And I want to talk a little tonight about what we do with that question of facts and feelings when we're trying to figure out being of service to one another and trying to understand each other and fix a little bit of our brokenness and make our way through the fragility of a very complicated world. So I want to think about that in the frame of knowing a few things about this day in history on uh, April, April 8th. April 9th, tomorrow, is uh, Fulbright's birthday, and I'm going up to Fayetteville to uh, celebrate that tomorrow. But for here, I was thinking three different dates. You know, today, 1789, was the first convening of the House of Representatives. Downhill since, <laughs> oh, no, not really. Uh, it was also, fast forward from there, the first day of the Work Progress Administration in the 30s. A very different time and sense of what public service meant. And it was also, for those of us old enough here, the final episode of one of the kind of pioneering shows in American television, All in the Family, last episode. And this was Archie Bunker. And in the final episode, his wife, Edith, is sick. And Edith is in bed, and Archie's pretty annoyed because it's St. Patrick's Day. Does anybody remember this episode? St. Patrick's Day, and Archie, of course, is the bigoted one. He's sort of the red state, and she's the blue, if you'll have it, of course, right? And the great thing about the show is they both have their rightness and wrongness, right? And that's America in its uh, genius. And so he comes up to the bedroom and she's there. and He's a little annoyed that uh, she's not there for him at the party. And uh, he sees her laid out in bed. And he said, what, do you have a fever or something? And he goes to pull the thermometer out of her mouth, which turns out to be a lollipop. And he looks at her and says, you know, Edith, you're always too, being too good. And I'm suffering for that. And I think that's our American story about our ambivalence about public service the do-gooder, the sense that we have about being deeply uncomfortable about our reliance on others, our need for others, the truth that we're maybe not enough for ourselves. It reminds me of the sense of our duality of two things, and we talk about a lot in diplomacy of two kinds of power hard power, military might, soft power, public diplomacy, international engagement, um, educational exchange. Our good friend, Hillary Clinton, who was my extraordinary boss, the State Department, whatever some people say, may mistakenly say about uh, something called Benghazi or not, uh, she said, you know, I don't really like that schema of smart, uh, soft, and hard power because generally it's a way of trapping things between a male way of thinking and a supposedly female way of thinking. I'd rather change the dynamic and talk about smart power. Let's look for solutions. Let's get things done. But 
either way you look at it, it reminded me of an experience when I was uh, in Nepal. And I was told by this Buddhist monk a parable about the flags that flutter over all the temples there. And a master overhears two students debating about is it the wind that's moving or the flags? The students are debating back and forth about which one. And finally, the master says, don't you see, you argue and debate back and forth. It's actually your minds that are moving. The banners of the wind, those issues of dichotomies, friend, foe, truth, beauty, rich or poor, dead or alive, sick or well, small or big, public or private, save or win, save or spend, win or lose, hearts or minds. Think how many of these oppositions seem essential to our way of thinking. Think too, at least in English, how often these words are so often basic, so often monosyllables of how we communicate, love, hate, yes, no, left, right even seemingly wired in our very cerebral makeup. The philosopher Kierkegaard, who's one of the most important of philosophy, said they're embedded in the questions of who we are. In his work, Either Or, he said our lives are a complicated struggle between inner and outer, ethical and aesthetic, habits and hopes. And since I'm a writer and since April is National Poetry Month, I'm going to indulge in a little talk about some poets. The poet John Keats called our acceptance of having to deal with both of these at once, inner and outer, yes and no, and no place to decide between them, he called that having negative capability, the strength, the gift of being able to live in and with contradictions. Or as Emily Dickinson wrote, I dwell in possibility, a fairer, and here she meant more beautiful house than prose, a fairer house than prose. Do own possibility a fairer house than prose, more beautiful house. And she also meant, and this is important to public service, I do own possibility a fairer, more just house than prose. Because possibility is about what people deserve, what's just, what's fair, what's right. I think back to decisions about fact, and think of our own Supreme Court and a group of Fulbright scholars I was talking to from other countries who came, and I visited with them in St. Louis. They were talking about the Dred Scott case, and learning that the Supreme Court said that Dred Scott was not a man, that he was not an American that he was property. The Chief Justice Taney at the time said slavery was now forever, quote, beyond politics. It is a legal fact. Again, facts are stupid things, particularly when they're wrong. The great Frederick Douglass said after the Supreme Court ruled, the fact is, the more the question has been settled the more it needs settling. Settled questions often mean that somebody's been silenced. Someone settled on one side, and someone settled, shoved, corralled, divided on the other. The work of democracy often means the work of unsettling us. Democracy puts us all together because it's a work of honest difficulty in trying to live amidst one another freely. 
And democracy is unsettling because it demands that we acknowledge that we are fundamentally all politicians. We're all our legislators figuring these complicated truths out. And in that, the facts aren't enough because I have mine, you have yours. But we have to be neighbors in it. And what the problem that's so strange that's happening in our politics, at least in Washington, is that we're not neighbors. We don't even have drinks or dinner together in Washington anymore. It's a very odd thing. It reminds me when I first took my international trip, it was in 1986, and I had never left the country, and I went to Haiti. And I only went to Haiti because I was working in a soup kitchen in South Boston. And I was working there because I was uh, working in a Catholic parish, and we had a lot of race problems in Boston. And we were taking lots of white working class, mostly women from the parish were deeply involved and good. And they went to do relief work in Haiti. They wouldn't speak to any black people in Boston, but they would fly, go to Haiti, work there, and felt very good and engaged. So we had to leave the country, all of us, to learn, and I'd never really met any black people before being a kid on a farm. We happened to be there when baby Doc Duvalier fled the country. We were actually far up in a parish in the mountains that had taken us three days to get to, and the way the news of his flight reached us was actually drums from village to village, like a telegraph, and a French priest understood what they meant and told us. But the point was that they had to leave where they were to go back and find out who they were. And it happens to us all the time, right, that we don't understand the people right next to us, and sometimes we have to get away and come back. Bill Clinton did it, right? went away to school to come back and see who he was, and he still does that. He talks about needing to come home, be away from that. Because we're human, we can't escape ourselves. We're always asking, always searching. What we need to do in that, though, is bring depth and discipline to the questions, which happens at a school like this. We have to ask difficult questions as well as serious ones. We have to have alternatives to the lies we're leading and the lives that government, businesses, media, schools, family, even powerful strangers are trying to persuade us or force us to lead. And what that demands Schools like this are able to provide it. Places outside of our own experience give it to us, being in another culture. What that demands is the power of imagination. The late poet and activist Adrian Rich said, it's imagination's job to transcend and transform our experience. Now that may not sound like the project for your commute to work in the morning. But it is where our freedom really lies, not in simple commuter, uh, consumer choices or ballot boxes, but in our capacity to imagine and make our own lives. And it's the only thing that's going to break the stalemate of how we're looking at red and blue and the frozen kind of politics that we have in our country. So I'm just asking, in our country, culture of technology and measurement, where we try to classify and contain things, that we recognize that they may actually be indefinable, unclassifiable. 
We may too often try to possess certainties rather than share questions. If it's difficult to understand what power is, hard, soft, or even smart, I think it's even more difficult to imagine what it should really be used for. How do we make it possible for people to flourish in a wounded world? How do we create the possibilities for happiness when there are shortages, greed, violence, differences of history and value? And whose happiness deserves to prevail? I'll tell you, these are not the questions that happen when we're making decisions about Ukraine or Iraq, but perhaps they should be. One expression that has a long history in the exercise of power in our country is the conviction that we must win hearts and minds. In 1818, almost 200 years ago, John Adams wrote a letter to a Baltimore newspaper editor named Niles. H. Niles describing where the American Revolution really took place was in the minds and hearts of the people. This radical change in the principles, he said, opinions, sentiments, and affections of the people, he wrote, that was the real American Revolution. Skip a generation forward, the Franklin Roosevelt, who on this date started the WPA, often employed the expression seeking, quote, the union of hearts and minds of the people in all states, devoted with the unity to the human welfare of our country. Then 50 years ago, on April 2nd, 1963, John F. Kennedy began using the term in its current sense telling Congress how in Latin America, perhaps the most significant of all, he said, would be a change in the hearts and minds of the people, a growing will to develop their countries. And then only two years later, Lyndon Johnson claimed that the ultimate victory in Vietnam will depend upon the hearts and minds of the Vietnamese people. From the American military point of view, the Vietnamese hearts and minds were obviously not so dependable. Since Vietnam, both in earnest and with sarcasm, winning hearts and minds has been a way to describe our military engagements. It became a central theme in our counterinsurgency planning under President Bush with a newly published Army and Marine Corps counterinsurgency manual claiming, quote, protracted popular war is best countered by winning the hearts and minds of the populace. But what would it really mean for me to win your heart or your mind? And I really mean for you to stop and think about that seriously. Such a win would be a kind of fragile miracle, wouldn't it? And what if I had won it? It would be such an immense responsibility. It would be something that would risk trust. Would it be love? If I had, though, through my charms and powers and persuasion, somehow won your heart and mind, would you have also won mine? What if you then changed your mind or had a change of heart? No matter how decent our intentions or benign our strategies, one of the problems with persuasion is that it is not an effort of tender wonderment and questioning because persuasion is not meant to explore truth but to enforce it. Soft power is still meant to be power, our power. And yet the point of truth, as I was saying at the beginning, not letting the facts stand in the way of a good story, the point of truth is not that it's possessed, but that it's sought, that it's provisional, that we're free to choose it and to contest those who claim to know what it is or that they're certain that they have it. 
That's what a school does. It's even as in talking to the faculty today at lunch, constantly questioning what public service even is. Perhaps what we should struggle for then is not so much power, and I see this the world over, but a related idea, authority. Authority in the sense of being the authors of ourselves, working toward an understanding of who we are, what would mean the power of saying who we are, who we belong to others as much as it would to us, because others see and hear what we say and do and form beliefs about what that means. Our authority in presenting ourselves to the world and using that linguistic root, the authenticity with which we present ourselves, that actually might convince other people to bestow on us, however briefly, some power. Power not won, but given to us. So I would pose it not as power brokers do today, but attempt to be authors, to make our words questions, to have conversations, to share the gifts of possibility and surprise, the power of learning from one another. It reminds me of, to close, the last story I was told by that monk. And I was leaving the monastery in this uh, trek in Nepal and he said there was a, I asked him how long it would take to get down to the next base camp. And he said, well, there was a monk traveling in a land and he saw someone working his garden and asked how much further he had to go down the mountain. And the person looked at him and didn't say anything. And he asked again, the person said nothing. So traveler just shrugged his shoulders and walked on. And when he was about 100 yards up the road, the man shouted to him, it'll take you about two days. And the monk was startled and turned around and shouted back, why didn't you say so earlier? I thought you were deaf. And the farmer shrugged his shoulders and shouted back, well, I had to see how fast you walk. So we have to look and listen and ask lots of questions because we don't know and we have to tell stories to ourselves, about ourselves, as we figure that out. My favorite poet, Emily Dickinson, did this her entire life, asking questions. And since it is National Poetry Month, I'll leave the last words to her. I know nothing in the world that has as much power as a word. Sometimes I write one, and I look at it until it begins to shine. Thanks. We have time for some questions, uh, and I want to ask one off the bat. In the in the in the your, your talk about hard power, soft power, smart power, um, the Fulbright program um, over the years created probably a lot of soft power and smart power. As we look ahead to the Fulbright program, what do you see? What 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 do you see? Is it is a Expansion, what, what, what's the future of the Fulbright program? Well, um, the first thing I see is, for, for people who don't know the details, of, the Fulbright program is in 160 countries. We have almost uh, between eight and 10,000 participants in, in a year, two thirds of them from other countries come to the United States and uh, a third Americans going abroad from almost 
all 50 states and their short Fulbrights, long Fulbrights, um, ranging in people just out of college to people in very advanced age. So it's an extraordinarily complex and large program, and I, I think the only thing that I would say defines it is, is uh, excellence, that it is for people who've really achieved something significant, but that's not necessarily ivory tower academia at all. But it suffers in the United States from great misperception that it might be the Rhodes Scholarship and that it's somebody going to Florence to study art history. And, uh, and that misperception about a certain kind of privilege and smallness and academic mindset, um, that makes it at risk. And uh, some of the responsibility is on people who are in the program and some of the history that's happened and how it's gotten administered in, in years taken away from the State Department and run by contractors, such. But the result is that in, for the first time in 68 years of this program, uh, this White House has uh, put a cut in the budget it sent to Congress. It's a 13% cut. There's a lot of sacrifice happening in, in budgets uh, all around uh, Washington. And as you know, with federal budgets, that's not the end game. We have no idea what will play out with that. And that, that actual budget would be a year and a half from now as it plays down. But uh, so Fulbright is not e in a easy and safe and, and uh, unchallenged place. But then again, nothing is in, in on, uh, you know, we, we have um, people in, in Congress who would wipe out just about every discretionary program there is from education to the environment. So we're not immune to that. But even our allies in this have some question about the efficacy of Fulbright, partly because what's happened is the landscape of higher education, which you deal with every day, transforms all the time. It's international. It is uh, engaged differently. It, technology has changed it. And when Fulbright began, people actually got on, on ocean liners and disappeared for a year. And this was the only exchange program that existed right after World War II. It was really dovetailed with the Marshall Plan in, in rebuilding the world. And now there are many exchange programs. And so to be at the leading edge of what that exchange is, I think Fulbright has to define itself better. We're also in a time where, in the age of social media, if uh, what's wanted are short-term exchanges and broad numbers, then those, if you would call them tweets, Fulbright is a novel. And people don't read novels anymore. So the idea that people go away for a long period of time, do deep research, get graduate degrees, learn another language, uh, you know, there's, there's deep skepticism about government's engagement in that kind of long-term, serious uh, in, engagement with another culture, or whether we have the time and, and clarity to do with that. Government doesn't think in those long-term solutions, but, but that's true at a local level. You know, do we pay for infrastructure? Do we think ahead to how we deal with people's pensions? And so it's not unique to this, but, but we confront that issue of do we make those investments? That, and Fulbright is a, an investment. Uh, you know, we, there's a new program called the Young African Leaders Program. It's a cornerstone of the president's uh, engagement with the young people in Africa. And I handed uh, the White House a list of 100 people who are prime ministers, heads of universities, one person won the Nobel Prize, people run major businesses, all sorts of 
NGOs and things in Africa who had been Fulbright scholars over the years. And, you know, it was just a quick list of some of the more prominent names. And, you know, the person who saw it said, that's only 100 people. And they just had a Google Hangout with 5,000 people. And, you know, to my mind, well, those are apples and oranges, and I don't not want you to have 5,000 young people in a hangout with the president. But to look at a program that's invested in these relationships with people who studied in the United States, have 30 years of contacts here and we there, and now they've, you know, have those, you know, I, I don't think, uh, well, I don't need to, I'm preaching to the choir right here about the value of that kind of long-term engagement. But it isn't the thinking uh, of, of the moment. And we need to do much, much more to prove the value of that. And partly because the State Department's whole way of communicating is overseas. Very few people, certainly members of Congress, don't know what the Fulbright program is. And, you know, they vaguely, vaguely know, and they, you know, they would just know it's a prestigious scholars program. And so there isn't a natural constituency. And one of the things that I'm spending some time up in Fayetteville about in our preparation for the 70th anniversary is to, is to make that network much stronger. And social media actually will be of help to that because it's much easier to pull people together and that power of all those people. Yeah, okay, let's see. Greg? Hello, I'm Greg Potter. I'm a second year student here. Uh, my question actually deals with also Allison's introduction. What, you mentioned Haiti and Nepal, but what was your it changed my life moment? What was what? What was your it changed my life moment when uh, being abroad and working? That's interesting. I think the, the, the moment that uh, changed my life as chair of Fulbright was uh, actually in, uh, in Nepal when you know, you get to drag to many ceremonial functions and you, you get thanked for things you had no business being thanked for just because you're the representative. And so I show up at um, the government house and there are people waiting in a line of easily 200 long, we're all alumni of the Fulbright program, and each one, it's a tradition, has, has come with a, a, with a piece, uh, and, and it's namaste, and, you know, and, and they wait and photograph. And, and one man who was in his mid-80s came up and did this. And when he bowed and, and did namaste, he had a piece of paper in his hands. And I was meant to take it when we bowed it. Did, and it was the letter from 1953 signed by Senator Fulbright, congratulating him on winning his Fulbright, and he got his PhD in physics in the United States, and he has kept it in his breast pocket his entire life. And that, you know, to think that that's the kind of effect that this program has had. And he started the, phys he started the university in Kathmandu, this man, and you know, then became the Minister of Education. And so the multiplier effect of his experience and the attitude he had toward the United States was, you know, how do you calculate what that is? So, and I have many experiences like that. Yes, question over here. Would you say something about um, the changes in the world and the United States um, status in the world and how gradually that changes the decisions you make on where to send people, but how we respond to requests for where to send people. 
Sure. Um, and they change so rapidly. For example, I spent a great deal of time in my first two years as chair in Egypt, where we were immensely hopeful and we put a lot of money into our program there and sent a lot of new young Americans there and uh, had a lot of Egyptians come to the United States and we found a way to get the less privileged Egyptians. One of the challenges you have in developing countries to getting people from those countries to come here is the people with the English skills developed enough to do graduate work here are often privileged. They've learned English. So how, and particularly women in, in Muslim countries, how do you find them? So, but we have a, a program for teaching foreign languages in American universities. And interestingly, often the people who are best at teaching beginning languages are not the you know, elite scholars, and, but they're people who teach those languages and teach other subjects in high schools. And so often those are women in, outside the capital city, and they're often in traditional uh, roles. And so they bring those cultures to the United States. And so we've had a lot of uh, Islamist women from Egypt. Things happened. It was an extraordinary time. And you know, we had to pull all our young Americans out of Egypt. And, um, that program is very complicated. We have our largest Fulbright program is in Pakistan, but it's actually Pakistanis coming to the United States. We have no, uh, we have a few Fulbright senior scholars who go to Pakistan, but no young people there. Um, we've been touch and go with Ukraine. We have no Americans in Crimea. Although fascinatingly, we have one woman who's a Tatar in Crimea in the parliament who got accepted recently to a Fulbright program and is coming to the United States as a Ukrainian from Crimea. So, but there are, um, there are hot spots and, and, and we engage with those and not, but if we have an open embassy and it's relatively safe on the ground, we just had to get a young woman out of Nigeria. Uh, it's actually a somewhat interesting story. She was very angry about the uh, new anti-gay laws that uh, the president came out with there. And so she decided, like any good uh, American academic, that she was going to protest this. And she told me about it in advance, and I said, well, I would think twice about doing that. I mean, you're an American, you, you won't, it's very, very unlikely that you'll be physically hurt, but, you know, lots of things could happen and could be uncomfortable for you, and uh, I really wouldn't suggest doing this, particularly not on CNN, which she then told me she was going to do. So I told the American embassy that they should prepare to bring her home the next day. I said, oh, they said, no, 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 she wants to stay. I said, she won't tomorrow. <laughs> and she wanted to come home the next day because you know, she wasn't prepared for the kind of ostracism she received even from her friends for that there. So you get incidents like that. But you have a lot of brave Americans who get out there and engage. Anna, you got a question here? Hi, my name is Anna Applebaum, and I'm a first year student here at the Clinton School. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I'm really interested in the idea of the ambivalence of the American national myth towards public service, mm -hmm. you know, the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more of ways that we can, as aspiring public servants, think through how to use this sense of individualism and self-sufficiency as a way to sort of incorporate those in, and promote public service ideals, if, if that's the landscape of the sort of American national myth and all these stories. Are there ways that we can use those to promote public service? Sure. Uh, well, look, uh, I grew up, I live in a big city, 
and uh, work at a university, you know. And so, but I grew up on a small farm, and people from Arkansas, you know the kind of place I grew up, and I respect those values in a way that I think, unfortunately, a lot of progressives are too dismissive of. And to be honest with you, I think it, it's e too easy for a condescension to creep into, and I understand the frustration. I mean, just look at climate change debate and the demonization of, you know, it, it, at times it will just seem ridiculous where the facts are so clear what is preventing this. But it's, it's somewhat useless, right, if, if, if the interest of, there's a really interesting piece by Ezra Klein on this very subject. He started a new, this is a journalist from the Washington Post that started a new uh, website called, called Vox.com, and he has a piece called Politics Makes Us Stupid in, in yesterday's, which is very much about this subject and, and the research around how all of us uh, find the facts that surround our values. And he talked about Sean Hannity and climate change. Just use the example of Sean Hannity would have, and it could be anybody, but Sean Hannity has so much at stake in his job and everything else of, in, in supporting climate change deniers that he would lose his job if he were suddenly to get the religion of climate change is real. He'd be ostracized from his peers and everything. You don't, none of us do that. None of us do. None of us changes, you know, if you're an academic who's uh, a gun control advocate, you don't come in the next day and decide, you know what, I really want to be a member of the NRA and I've actually misunderstood the Second Amendment. So I think we misunderstand often what people's attachments are to values and we're, we're not engaging with people for who they are and with the stories they have. And instead we get a superior attitude about the, the facts that we have. And then so we end the conversation. And what, what good is that when you really are trying to say, immunize young women uh, against the, uh, uh, yes, HPV virus. So, you know, you need to get to the facts. I mean, you need to get to the results that you want. And I think the problem is we've hit the wall on a number of s stories. And so let's change the story somehow. Tom, thank you very much for being here. I know there are other questions. Please feel free to come up and talk to him. But we're honored to have you here and please know we want to do everything we can to support the Fulbright program. It's been great for Arkansas, for America, and the world. Let's give Tom a thanks. Thanks for having me.